Hope you're having a good week. Had this little uh, rainstorm kind of pop up today. It was wild because this afternoon it was hot and clear, I mean sunny and clear and warm and then all of a sudden went in to get ready for Bible class, came back out and it's pouring the rain. So uh, it can, time of the year when the weather can change real quickly. Um, but I'm glad to see you're here and I'm sure we'll have a few more trickle in as we get started. Um, in just a minute, we're going to be back in our study in First, uh, First Kings chapter 8, or chapter 7, I think is where we're starting uh, tonight. Um, so if you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles there, that'll be good. Uh, before we do, um, I want to begin by saying thank you to all those who volunteered for, uh, for helping out in VBS. Really appreciate that. Um, Looking forward to that as we uh, summer moves forward. Uh, you know, we volunteered Mark to to do a lot of stuff. I think, didn't we? Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, any other announcements that I, that we need to be aware of? <coughs> All right, so speak now forever, hold your peace. Uh, on your prayer, or in your prayers, on our prayer list, if you will add um, Jonathan Matthews' brother James Matthews, um, he has a health situation that's very serious. Uh, he's in a coma right now. They don't, uh, as far as I know, there's no brain activity going on. Um, and unfortunately, he's not a member of the kingdom, and so that's weighing heavy on on our brother's family and him especially. So please uh, remember uh, James and Jonathan, that family, in your prayers. Um, Brian, who else do we need uh, to remember? Riley also had sent a message um, asking for prayer that mom and dad uh, was supposed to come this past weekend. Fell and broke her L3 vertebrae in her back. Was that Riley or was that Vicky? Vicky Riley. Vicky Riley, yeah. Yes. Vicky Riley. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. I had seen that and we definitely, uh, her mom's visited with us a few times and uh, need to remember her. Yeah. No, her mom her fell. Mom fell. She was supposed to come visit, also, I know Miss Carol is away. Uh, she is in Tennessee. Uh, yeah. So remember her. I think she's been gone about a week. Uh, I remember her. She's traveling. Anyone else? Anybody have an update on Harry and Mary? They're doing good. Here, I mean, they, they were able to, they, I talked to them, they went to a doctor appointment. They just, the, the weakness is lingering for them. They just don't quite have the strength back. Mm. But they're doing all right, considering. Uh, remember, remember them in your prayers as well. They get their strength back. Also, I want to mention, I'd mentioned uh, asking for prayers for Lisa's sister, Treat, and she had an MRI and got some good news back. So thank you for your prayers for that. Anyone else? All right. If not, let's go to God in prayer. <clears throat> Almighty God and Father above, thank you so much for your great love and the generous um, mercy that you show to us each day. Father, please continue to forgive us where we fall short. Father, please bless our study this evening. I pray, Father, that all that we discuss and look at uh, is honest to your word that uh, we will have a genuine spirit and mind and heart to uh, to take in what what you have to say to us to learn from uh, from these examples um, to be encouraged and at the same time exhorted father we pray that uh, you'll continue to bless our congregation while we're especially mindful of those on our prayer list those that we've mentioned tonight, uh, we know you know uh, what's best for us and for, 
for those that we're thinking about. And we just ask you to intervene and to be with these individuals. And, and Father, in whatever way we can be of assistance, we, are, uh, we, we pray for opportunities to serve. Father, thank you again so much for Jesus, for, uh, for the forgiveness that he offers through his blood. Father, I pray that uh, as we um, move forward into this class, that you'll continue to be with us. And, and Father, that, uh, that, that all of this will be to, the, to your glory and honor. All this we ask in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. All right. So, uh, as I mentioned, we have... Uh, been considering um, First Kings. We've moved over into the life of Solomon. Uh, we noticed in our last class, uh, Solomon, uh, during, during his reign, uh, especially during the early part of his reign, even into older age, he had been given a, a real period of peace and prosperity for the nation. A, a different uh, a difference between him and, and David was the fact that Solomon was not a king of war, but he really was a king of peace and prosperity. We also noted uh, in our class, um, and, and I know doing this part of the study, it's a lot of detail, and so it doesn't lend itself to as much discussion as other topics do, but I think it's important, and we began to look at, at Solomon uh, building the temple, and we discussed that. We also discussed uh, his own home just a little bit. Um, the details there in, in eight and nine, uh, seven, eight, and nine are, are really detailed at looking at, at that. And as we kind of finish that section up, we'll, we'll look at, and again, I apologize for a small print, uh, <laughs> let you know there's a lot on this slide. <laughs> but, um, you know, as we move forward, uh, we'll look at the, the construction of the temple furniture just real briefly. Uh, we'll also look at uh, the Ark of the Covenant or Ark of the Lord being brought into the temple and what God does in response. Uh, we'll, we'll notice Solomon's response to God blessing uh, this construction, this, uh, this coronation, if you will, of the temple. Um, he lifts his hands in prayer to the Lord. He also asks for blessings upon the people of Israel. The Lord will then appear to Solomon a second time. You remember what happened the first time? What did God do? And what happened? Yeah. So... You know, God appearing in Solomon's life was a very good thing for Solomon. Uh, he'll appear a second time here. Uh, we'll note some other acts of Solomon real briefly, some other things that, that he did. Uh, it, um, it's interesting, the middle part of Solomon's reign, there's not a lot of detail about it. Um, and that's one of the things I'm kind of struck by, especially when you compare him to David. You know, the Bible, even Saul had a lot of information about, about those two men. Uh, the middle part of his reign isn't really like that, uh, <clears throat> uh, but uh, we will note some things that did occur. Uh, and then the Bible uh, lays out for us uh, this, this visit from the Queen of Sheba, and, and we'll talk about why she came and what happened uh, briefly. Also, Solomon's uh, great wealth, we'll just note that. Uh, God said that he would give him great wealth. Well, he does. Um, and then you get to the sad chapter of Solomon's life. And I think it's really sad in one way that he's an older man when this occurs. You would have thought he would have gained a lot of wisdom by this point. Well, he was the wisest man to live, right? But he makes some terrible decisions. And we'll note that God will then, as a result raise up some adversaries against Solomon and the nation. Uh, and then if we get there, of course, um, we'll, we'll look at the end of Solomon's life, the end of his reign. All right, so let's jump back into our, our looking here at the, at the construction of the temple furniture and, and what's going on there. Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 7, this is where we left off last week. Um, 
We've just looked at uh, the previous verses, looked at uh, his house. You may remember how long did it take him to build the temple? Seven years. How long did it take him to then build uh, his own house? Thirteen. So, so you're looking at a twenty-year span that this occurs. So this is, I mean, twenty years is, I think, a long time, right? A lot occurs in our life in twenty years. You know, think about. 20 years ago where you were and think about where you are now. Do you think a lot's happened in that time frame? Well, Solomon lived about an age like we expect to live to. 20 years is a significant portion of time. Um, if, uh, and then, so those first 12 verses deal with the construction of his home, his palace. And then we get into verse 13 and Solomon then has, has Hiram come back in and they begin to construct some of the, uh, the furniture in the temple itself. So he goes back to the temple uh, to kind of complete this, this narrative on that part. Verse 13 says, And King Solomon sent and brought Hiram from Tyre. And it gives us, um, it didn't give us when it first mentioned Hiram this detail, but it does now. Uh, it says that he was a son of a widow of the tribe of Naphtali. So he has a connection to the Jewish people. Uh, so he seems to be biracial, um, uh, but yet not living as a Jew. So he, he has a Jewish heritage on his mom's side, uh, but, not, uh, but not living like that. Uh, you think about some other famous people from Scripture. You think about Paul. Paul was a biracial man. He was both Jew and Gentile. He had his, um, oh, his father was a Jew and his mom wasn't. Uh, whereas Timothy was the opposite. Timothy, you might remember, was his mother was of Jewish heritage, but his father wasn't. And, his, um, and so you kind of have um, here another situation where... Um, Hiram is connected to the Jewish people. His father was a man of Tyre, a worker in bronze. Uh, and he was full of wisdom, understanding, <coughs> and skill for making uh, any work in bronze. Uh, what's significant about that? <coughs> Okay. Make idols. Yeah. And it's probably, I mean, it's probably not a far-fetched idea that he did that. But um, people during this period, what's that? Yeah, that bronze support. A lot of the furniture will be made out of bronze. That's why he mentions it. The first time we note Hiram's importance is because of the wood he can provide. And if we go back and we look at the construction of the temple, there's a lot of wood inside of it that's overlaid with gold, but that wood forms the base. Well, this time they're going to talk about the furniture. Well, the furniture has a lot of bronze materials involved. Now, what's significant... Um, I don't know if, if the world works this way as much today as it, as it did then, but when, when somebody learned to trade, that's what they did. Now, we've gotten to a point in our culture where people can kind of move from career to career. Uh, you're not stuck in one career. But like, at that time, you learned a trade from young, from young adulthood, even before you became an adult, <coughs> you began to learn the family trade. And that's what you were expected to do. And so uh, Hiram would have learned this from a young age. Now it's interesting, he's king now, yet he held on to that, um, on to that trade as he got older. Um, and, and so as you continue in the text there, it goes into detail, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but um, unless you have a question about anything. But he, he, 
if you look to the rest of chapter 7, he gets into the, into the details about what, what they were making, what they were creating. I think one of the neat things that they do um, mention here, if I can find the verses I'm looking for. They talk about these pillars that they built, which is really fascinating. You start in verse 15. I just encourage you to go back and read that. And, and you read about how, how they were just so intricately designed. They were really not pillars, maybe not necessarily functional pillars, but, but just at their beauty and, and the way they were built. Um, one thing, and, and it may be earlier, and I'm trying to find here, but he discusses the, the cherubim that they had constructed to go into the holy place, separating the, the holy place from the most holy place, and how you have these two huge uh, cherubim structures that face one another with their wings coming across. Uh, and I just, it kind of fascinated, fascinated me reading about it. What's that? Yeah, okay, so if you go back there and you read about that and how they constructed that, and... <coughs> go ahead. Well, the wings touched the wall as well, and there were five cubic on each wing, so there's ten cubic, and ten cubic gave you twenty, which was the whole width of the... Yeah, and if you think about a cubit, what's a cubit? A cubit's about 18 inches. I don't know, somebody do the math on that. That's... Um, uh, that would be about seven and a half cubits, or seven, uh, sorry, seven and a half feet uh, per, uh, per wing coming across. So you got 14 feet of wings just across the, you know, there across the, where the most holy place is. And uh, it would have been something to see. I think it would have been beautiful uh, to behold. And so, like I mentioned, the rest of the chapter goes into all that. I won't uh, sit there and, and, and keep going through every one of those. But I do think it's interesting that the Bible records all that information for us uh, as a way to describe the beauty of this place. What's interesting to me is if you go back to Exodus, when Moses is talking about building the tabernacle, uh -huh. talking about God endowing people with skill for the, making the curtains and making all the ornament, you know, gold uh, candlesticks and so forth. And the detail God put into the tabernacle was really tremendous. Mm -hmm. And here you got Solomon building the temple and it doesn't say God actually can be, but you get that same sense. Mm -hmm. of, uh, well, and I think it's kind of fascinating and I'll move on, but um, that God was very direct in certain areas, but then he left up a lot to artistic, human artistic ability. All right, if somebody said, I want you to sit down and draw a cherubim, and that's all they told you, what would you draw? But that's kind of what God does for them. <clears throat> I hate to ask this, but somebody get me a water bottle. My throat, I've got a itchy a tickle in my throat. I can't get rid of it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. So, uh, so yeah, I, I'm, so like when, when you're talking about, even with the, uh, the tabernacle back in Exodus, when, when they're constructing that and they're, they're, they're making those curtains and they're putting those designs on there, God doesn't like... It, there it seems to me to me to be no indication he just gave them inspirational knowledge and you know put it in their head, but that he allowed them the freedom to to construct this uh, how they saw fit, and so God allowed them the ability there. That was one of those times when it was left up. Thank you very much. Left up to uh, to people to kind of fill in the blanks there on how that should look. So. Again, I'd love to go back and see it. Bad thing is they didn't have cameras in, so we don't have any pictures of what it looked like. But I would be fascinated to see the, the temple Solomon built. Any other questions or comments about that?
All right, so uh, if we go down just to the end of chapter 7, uh, verse 51, Thus all the work that Solomon did on the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in the things that uh, David his father had dedicated, the silver, the gold, and the vessels, and stored them in the treasuries of the house of the Lord. And so they're, they're all kept there. Why did Solomon put all these treasures in, in the temple and not in his palace? Okay. Yeah. They're gods. I think there's a significant thing there. It would have been very easy for him to say, let's build a little... A little uh, um, you know, treasure chest in, in, in my house, and we'll put them all there. But they don't belong to him. And I think it's fascinating, later on, when we get to Hezekiah, Hezekiah's going to get in trouble because he's going to have some dignitaries come and visit him, and he's going to go show them the treasury of the Lord. And it's going to cost Israel because he did that. Those things belong to God. They don't belong to Him. And I think there's a significant thing about that. Think about that today. Let's, let's, let's bring that thought forward to today. Are there things that belong to God and not to us? Like what? Okay, this facility, if you want to look at the facility, then I want to look at what I think you're talking about. But this all belongs to God, right? Doesn't it? This belongs to God. Now, is this holy? No, I'm not trying to say that. But this is God's. How should that make our mindset in regard of all of this? Respectful. We should be respectful because of it. We need to see that as this is God's. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, I think where Jody was heading was even in a much larger sense, the church, and I'm talking about the, the spiritual being of the church is God's as well. And it belongs to Him, not to us. Now, sometimes do we treat it as though it is ours? Oh, yeah. That's why people get so opinionated. Forget And we ought to think about how we talk about it, how we treat it, how we pray about it or don't pray about it, how involved we are in it. Understand it belongs to Him. Our children are gods. They're a gift given to us. They're gods. They're not ours. I think if we saw things in the proper perspective in this regard, we would act differently. Mm hmm what about our time? It's really God's, isn't it? Doesn't He get to say when it begins and when it ends? Doesn't He give it to us? Is it really ours? We treat it like it's ours. But is it really? Our bodies was the first thing that came to mind. Our bodies. Um, you know, Paul says, I think it's 1 Corinthians, says that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. All right? Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which we have from God. Um, what's really the only thing we own? Our soul. Our soul. And that's it. And even that will go back to God to be judged. So, uh, I just found that fascinating kind of trying to think deeper about that. Well, let's move on to chapter 8. We'll go through these as quickly as we can, but uh, let's look at chapter 8. So everything's finished. Uh, the temple's built. The, the furnishings are in there. And so the final element to be brought in is the Ark of the Covenant. <coughs> so verse 1 tells us uh, Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes the leaders of the father's houses of the people of Israel, before King Solomon in Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is uh, Zion. A um, little interesting term there, Zion. 
uh, that is going to be used later on by John in the book of Revelation. It's not a term that's used a lot in Scripture, but there's significance to it. I don't have time to deal with it in this class, but I do encourage you to go back to the or to go to the end of Revelation chapter 20 and following, and notice how John, how the vision is shown to John about Zion. Uh, now, where was the ark? It was in the city of David. Now, the city of David is not technically uh, in Jerusalem. It's just outside. Uh, but that's where it's been held. Do you remember where? It was at a guy's house, wasn't it? Anybody remember? David said, I won't. Uh, the guy said, you can have it. David says, nope, I won't, uh, I won't do anything. It doesn't cost me something. All right, there's your homework assignment. Who's the guy's house? Where's it at? So they bring it, and they bring it to the, to the temple. Um, it says, let's go on here, um, verse 3, And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark, and they brought the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. Look at that. They bring the tent too. What's the tent? Yeah, the tabernacle. I wonder, I wonder if that's the same tabernacle. It's been around for a long time if it is. I'm sure it's been through a lot of repairs. That's 400 years, I think. At this point, no, it wouldn't be 400 years. I'm sorry. How long would it have been? I don't remember for sure. I won't say that. Has it been 400 years since they left Egypt? Okay. All right. So I was right. I shouldn't doubt myself. Yeah. Pretty fascinating, isn't it? The whole wonders. I mean, how many parents, moms, would love if their sons' clothes didn't wear out? All right? I, and, and so they're, they're getting it all, and that included the tabernacle itself. So they still have it at this point. I think that's kind of significant, um, that, that they still have that. Uh, it says they brought it, all the holy vessels you know, that were in the tent, and the priest and the Levites brought them up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were with him before the ark, sacrificing, notice this, so many sheep and oxen they could not be counted or numbered. It's a big ordeal, isn't it? Those priests are getting a workout, earning their pay, I guess, uh, for this day. Um, we've already noted that... that uh, like David, uh, maybe more so, Solomon was a man of sacrifice. He, he sacrificed a lot. Um, and so here they are again. They're sacrificing. We move on down to verse 6. Uh, they bring the ark um, of the covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house. Where is its place? The, in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the cherubim. So they bring it in. They, they take it then uh, to the back. Who's taking it in, by the way? The Levites. They're carrying it with those poles, you remember? Uh, they're not supposed to touch it. And they're taking it back. Um, verse 7, uh, For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the ark, so that the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. Uh, now you had cherubim overshadowing the 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 um, most holy place, and then you had cherubim on top of the Ark of the Covenant as well. Uh, there, um, verse eight says the poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary. Why do you think they were so long? I thought about it. It made me chuckle just a little bit, although it probably is too soon to chuckle. Uh, and they remember what happened last time it got touched. Poor fella. Um, 
Maybe they remember, uh, remember his legacy and, and, and what happened as a result. So they set it down in there. Um, uh, it says that uh, it could not be seen from the outside, and they, were, um, and they are there to this day. And so at the time of the writing of 1 Kings, you know, you still had the, the temple con, uh, there and, and everything just as it had been set up initially. Um, you go on in verse 9, it says, And um, there was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone that Moses uh, put there at Horeb, where the Lord had made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. What's strange about that? Yeah, uh, you know, we don't know. There's no information given about what happened to them. But at one time, we know you had the two tablets, two stone tablets, plus Moses' rod that had budded, plus a bowl of manna. And the thing that fascinates me is you weren't supposed to be opening that up. So you do, it makes my mind wonder what's happened. But the writer here is very explicit in saying that was it. That's all that was in there. Um, and I'm also fascinated, we talked about this in our Thursday morning class, was uh, I don't remember now when the last mention is, but it's not long after this that we, the Ark of the Covenant disappears. Um, to my knowledge, it's never mentioned again after the captivity. We never hear about it again. Uh, whatever happened to it? Now, my, my belief is, is that uh, when the Babylonians came in that last time and burnt the city of Jerusalem and burnt the temple down, it must have been destroyed in that fire. But that's speculation. Uh, but uh, but here, here it is. It's set down, verse 9. Um, there, verse 10 goes on to tell us that when the priest came out of the holy place, so they, they, they're coming out, a cloud filled the, the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Now, Mark and Si can both attest to, to, to the way smoke um, what's the word I'm looking for? It is difficult to try to get through. Um, like if y'all were to speak to it, what, what's the most difficult thing about trying to work in smoke? Visibility. Visibility. Hard to breathe. Like can you imagine what it would be like without your, I'm sure y'all have nice ventilation systems. Imagine what that would be like. What are you told in a fire? Get down, right? Because smoke rises. And so uh, here, here God fills the house with smoke. What's the significance to that biblically? That's what happened back in the original dedication of the tabernacle. Okay. And that's how they would know when to move and when to sit still. As long as the cloud was there before the tabernacle, they were to stay where they're at when they were wandering through the wilderness. And when it moved, they moved. And also, at times of, of sacrifice, you would have the smoke coming out of the tabernacle. And so there was significance to that. Also, the smoke involved with sacrifice, even the sacrifices outside of the temple uh, the smoke was, was a significant part of that. And so uh, what's, what's God basically saying here by, by the use of smoke? His presence. His presence. Is God now endorsing the construction of the temple? And it's God's way of putting his stamp of approval on it, that he's okay with this. Now, I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. But, but, but uh, it's God's, God's approval has been put on this place. Uh, the fact that he's filling it. Uh, Solomon in verse 12 
uh, it goes on to say, The Lord has said that he will dwell in thick darkness. I have indeed built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. The, uh, then the king turned around and blessed all the assembly, uh, while all the assembly of Israel stood. So um, Solomon sees what's going on. He, uh, he confirms that. Um, verse 15, uh, he continues, he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who, uh, who with his hand has feel, fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to David, my father, saying, Since the day that I brought uh, my people uh, Israel, uh, my people out of uh, my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose, now notice this, we mentioned this before, I chose no city out of all the uh, tribes of Israel uh, in which to build a house, that my name might be there. But I chose David to be over my people Israel. Now, we've mentioned that before. God never said, uh, he never gave the instruction to build a temple. That was David's initiative that wanted to build the temple. Now God allowed it. And we'll, I won't go back down that road, but I think there are some, some unintended consequences of what David did by building the, the temple uh, there in Jerusalem. And, uh, <clears throat> but he says, but I chose David to be my king, or my, sorry, to be... Um, I chose David to be over my people Israel. So David was chosen to be king. David wanted to do this, and so God allowed it because he chose David. Um, verse 20, um, Now the Lord has fulfilled his promise that he made, for I have risen in the place of David my father and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord, uh, as the Lord promised. I have built the house for the, uh, for the Lord for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. And there I provided a place for the ark in which the covenant of the Lord that he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. And so David, uh, you know, speaking about what they've done, acknowledging what's going on. And then he turns his hands to lift them up into prayer to the Lord. If we continue on in chapter 8, uh, he stands, verse 22, he says, uh, He stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of, Is assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven. And so he begins this prayer. Uh, I just want to note a couple things about it. Um, later on in verse 25, as he's, he's offering this prayer, he says, Now therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep uh, for your servant David, my father, what you have promised him, saying, You shall not lack for a man to sit uh, before me on the throne of Israel. And that's the promise God had made. But it was conditional, wasn't it? Notice he adds the condition here. He says, If only your son pays close attention to their way to walk before me, as you have walked before me. So God told David that. He said, you'll have a son to sit on the throne as long as they continue to be obedient and faithful. And that's going to be challenged. Uh, he goes on uh, in this same vein of thought, um, uh, continuing to pray uh, to God. And then he says uh, at the end of that, uh, prayer, verse 29, he says, that you may listen to the prayer of your servant uh, offers toward this place. And so he, he's going to go on to make some requests, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, for just a second. So he makes a few requests of God. Number one, uh, if you read through his prayer to God, he first asks for God to forgive those who sin against God and their neighbor. Um, all men fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, right? Um, we are all sinners, and that, that's something we have to acknowledge. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, if we say we have no sin, we are a liar and the truth is not in us. The key is, 
Are we willing to repent and to come back to God? So he asks for forgiveness. Good way to start a prayer. Second thing he prays for is he says to put an end to the drought when the people repent. He knows um, this may be a little bit prophetic from Solomon, um, but he knows there's going to be times when they sin and God, in, in order to discipline them, will send droughts upon them. You think about uh, you know, different times God used drought as a punishment, as a way to discipline. He, he, he asked God to end the drought if the people will repent, verses 35 and 36. Um, he says uh, he asked to put an end to famine when the people repent. Times God will use famine as a way to discipline. Uh, he says, um, interestingly enough, he kind of, I don't know, this doesn't seem to fit with some of the other things he's praying about, but in the middle of that, he prays that God will hear the prayer of the foreigner who turns to God. This seems to be um, a, a prayer for the proselyte, for the, for the one who has become Jew, a Jew uh, by proselytizing himself, by by taking on the customs of being a Jew, although he was born a Gentile. That's my guess, is what he's praying for here. Uh, and that God would hear their prayer. Um, he asked God to hear the prayer of the people as they go into battle. Um, and, and that God, God is with them uh, in their battles, as God has been uh, always with them when they've been faithful. Uh, and then finally, he prays for forgiveness on the people when they repent. So he, he kind of sandwiches this prayer with those two thoughts. Father, please forgive us when we fall short. God, please forgive us when we repent and come back to you. And, and so uh, that, that's his prayer there in chapter 8. Any questions about that? And then Solomon turns his attention to the people of Israel. He asks for blessings upon the children of Israel, verse 54. Uh, now Solomon finished offering all this prayer and plea to the Lord. He arose from before the altar of the Lord where he had knelt with his hands outstretched toward heaven. Uh, he stands up, verse 55, and he uh, he. Praise for blessings upon the people, verse 56. Uh, he says, Blessed be the Lord who's given rest to this people Israel according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed of his good promise, which he spoke by Moses, his servant. If you go on down to verse 61, um, he then uh, speaks to the people in this prayer. He speaks to them. He says, Let your heart therefore be wholly true and that's an interesting phrase because that'll come back up at the end of his life where the same prayer he had or the same kind of exhortation he gives to the people he himself should have heeded uh, needed to heed um, but he says that you be wholly true to the Lord our God <coughs> walking in his statutes and keeping his commandments as at this day. Uh, verse 62 this section ends by discussing um, the end of, of this kind of dedication ceremony that they have, this kind of extended dedication. It says that the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifice before the Lord. Solomon offered as peace offerings to the Lord 22,000 oxen, 120 sheep, 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. You know, you think about 22,000 oxen. Just think about the, the amount of time it would have taken to offer that amount of oxen. And then on top of that, to offer 120,000 sheep. Just think about the time that would take. Um, and so this isn't some short, quick ceremony. I know we like to tie our worship into an hour, right? We need it in that hour time frame or hour and a half or whatever it is. But this was, was an extended amount of time that, that they're dedicating to the Lord. And so 
as you have this ceremony uh, completing here, uh, you, you've had them there for a little while as they've dedicated. Uh, now, I know some of that's not the most interesting stuff to look at. We'll move forward. We'll have some more uh, stuff to discuss. It maybe will generate more discussion. The Lord will, uh, will appear to Solomon a second time. He'll remind him of what they've already looked at. And then we'll get into the end of his life and, and discuss that as we move into uh, Jeroboam and Rehoboam and some of the follies these two men get themselves into. Any questions, comments? All right, we'll be dismissed. Uh, we'll join back for a devotional in just a few minutes.